Bob Davis, welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. Rare gem, someone like you reaching out to do a show rather than having me, to have me reach out to my possible guest to have them come on. You reached out to me and you were nice enough to compile a whole list of questions and make a bio for me to ask. That makes things really easy and lovely. I love that very much. Just a few quick uh, disclaimers for my listeners, though. Um, it's great being back um, on the air. I just did a show recently, which I uploaded YouTube after like a two-week hiatus. I've gone through a lot in the past month, having to quit my my job, which I've been working at for 15 years as a clerk in my recently retired mother's ophthalmology office, um, because I refuse the dreaded shot, and everybody else has to get the shot because the government mandate is requiring everybody to get the shot, or else, being a medical business, it will not get any more government money. So I had no choice by December 8th. If I don't get the shot, they will pencil me. But fortunately, I have gotten a job at Whole Foods, the local Whole Foods, which is is wonderful because that's the only place I buy food from. And they, I'll get a 20% discount as an employee there. I love it. And, um, and I'm still, of course, going to be doing the show. And I'm still, of course, going to be um, monetizing the show. Um, although at this point, it's probably going to be 50% of the show is um, going to be uh, pay-per-view, uh, first 50% free, last 50%. Subscribe to Patreon, my Patreon account, if you want to uh, listen to it. It'll be in the video description. Also in the video description will be a link to where I also upload this um, these shows. It's kind of a miracle I haven't gotten kicked off YouTube yet with all this stuff I do that's worthy of YouTube's censorship. But um, I also upload my interviews to cost.tv, and I provide a link there, and I'd actually rather people listen to my interviews on cost.tv. Listen to you on YouTube for 15 seconds, though, just for the sake of giving me a view credit, because that certainly helps. And then click on the link in the, in the video description to the cost.tv page. I can actually make a little bit of money. The more people listen to that, the more um, blockchain monetization is made. So um, just wanted to get that out. But Bob Davis, uh, great having you on. You have a bunch of subjects worthy of talking about. Um, uh, we can go for an hour today. I'm uh, just going to get right to the questions, um, and you can answer them all. On, I'd like to ask you to do them on the fly. There's about uh, there's 13 questions here. I'll just go bit by bit. Um, so let's do this. And uh, your first uh, question, uh, usually the first thing I usually ask most of my guests is um, tell your life story from a primary source perspective, explain who you are and the stuff that you do. But while well, you pretty much um, put that out here in your first question, what is your motivation for doing a documentary on content? Consciousness. So why don't we start with that? I will put myself on mute. You got the floor again, but try to do these on the fly because we've got only an hour. Right. Uh, thanks for having me on. Real, real, real kind of you. Listen, um, I'm a retired professor. I studied the research uh, paradigm my whole life, uh, the brain, sensory systems, electrophysiology, all that stuff. But I've always been interested in the paranormal, ufology. And when I retired, I started writing books. I wrote The UFO Phenomenon, then I wrote a book on life after death. And the last book, Unseen Forces, The Integration of Science, Reality, and You, basically addresses consciousness, reality, the paranormal, UFOs, life after death, paranormal, parapsychology, ESP, the whole bit, everything, near-death experience, out-of-body experiences. All of, these see, all of these triggers, in other words, lead to a peak experience, a transpersonal event that changes one's personal viewpoints on life, reality, even the one they love for from that moment forward. The question is why? And more people are having them. So I thought, since not that many read books these days, it seems, do a documentary. I got in touch with, with a, a tremendous company, Gene Time Entertainment, and the rest is history. We're out of the gates. We're looking for funds. And our website is consciousnessfilm.info. Consciousnessfilm.info, the trailer's there, and uh, we we hope everyone can support it. Thank you very much. So, um, next question. Where are you and Dave Beatty now in the film production stage of development? Uh, when do you expect it to be released, and how are you obtaining support for the production? Well, right now, again, it's a, a GoFundMe production. Uh, we're, we're asking people to, to contribute. Uh, the best way they can. Uh, and it's awkward as, as it is to ask for money. That's the only way we can get our message out to the masses and attempt to shift that needle, that, that paradigm shift that we so sorely need, trying to integrate the science of the subjective with current scientific principles and maybe even quantum physics. 
which seems to make more sense than anything in terms of how it, it explains many of the you know paranormal perplexing things that that people can simply uh, are unable to explain using language alone because it's ineffable uh, nevertheless we, uh, we we expect that in a year or so we'll have the documentary completed uh, and uh, pending funding, of course. And the topic areas are going to range widely from near death to out of body experiences, unidentified aerial phenomena, uh, and everything in between. We have a tremendous cast Dr. Jeffrey Long, Dr. Diane Hennessy Powell, a neuropsychiatrist, Dean Radin, leading scientist in, in paranormal psychology, Tom Campbell, former NASA scientist, and he wrote My Big Toe, Virtual Reality Theory of. Uh, consciousness. Uh, we have a we have many experts and as well as uh, experiencers. And Dave Beatty of Dream Time Entertainment is an Emmy Award winner. So we have a, a great lineup. We have a, a tremendous production company. Uh, my two cents worth. Uh, and we got we got a good we got a good documentary developing. Dave Beatty, by the way, produced the Nimitz Encounters. For those of you familiar with that UFO documentary film, documentary film, which has over six million hits on YouTube already since May 29. So, his uh, broadcast journalism is a, a tremendous, uh, you know, positive too. And in, in, in addition to his extraordinary talents as an Emmy Award winning producer and, and film director. Lovely. Um, now, question number three, um, what is consciousness? Um, well, <laughs> before I give you the floor, um, I've heard people say, uh, well, Ian Zell Lungold, who uh, uh, was uh, the late Ian Zell Lungold, who uh, did the work um, of Carl Johann Kalimann, um, espoused it, said that consciousness is the awareness of being aware. And he said that um, their soul is um, the primary thing. And then our soul comes consciousness the awareness of being aware and then spirit spirit is sort of the same thing as soul although it's more specific it's basically the parts of the soul uh, that uh yeah the parts of the soul that get put out in specific times and places in the acknowledged illusion of space and time uh so uh that's just a little description i thought i'd throw out does that tie in with what you think um if what what consciousness um is yeah, I, I thanks for sharing that very much. Uh, you know, the, the, much of that has been written in varying ways throughout time, expressed in different ways because we don't, you know, we don't have the really the words to get at the essence of what we're truly truly trying to explain. And we've had endless stream of papers, as you well know, written on consciousness, generated by boy scholars across all different disciplines over the decades and centuries, you know, going back to Plato, Socrates. And the point is, you know, we still don't know what consciousness is, uh, even even with today's latest theories on panpsychism and holographic theory of consciousness, on and on. And, th and they are just that, uh, theories. Uh, it involves time and space, maybe, sure, sure, but maybe there are different types of consciousness, like the body, for instance, is conscious of itself. The autonomic nervous system obviously regulates functioning of the body. And when something goes out of out of whack, shall we say, let's say you have, you know, you have bleeding internally, the body tries to compensate. In other words, it's conscious of itself and it regulates itself within reason. Uh, but there's also you, the soul, as you mentioned, spirit, whatever we want to call that, that life force, the awareness of being aware, whatever, you, you know, that too is a different type of consciousness. Maybe that's a, a non-physical type of consciousness. So we have many different kinds of realities, many possible forms of consciousness going on simultaneously. That's how complex our world is when we try to integrate the two. You know, brain is conscious of 3D stuff. It came out of the primordial soup uh, uh, or was created by an external force, God, whoever. Um, uh, so it's good at interpreting auditory, visual, smell, all that stuff, but maybe it can't, it can't deal with the non-3D, the 4D, uh, where time is also a variation, a variable as well, not linear as in 3D. Um, you know, it's, it, it varies with space and time. They offset each other. It's relative, as Einstein said. And gravity affects it too. And Newtonian physics describes all that to a point, but doesn't go far enough. Uh, so 
So consciousness, boy, I used to think it was a way of being aware or dictating free will. Now I don't know. Maybe the universe is conscious and we interact with the external world. That's a distinct possibility too. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> next question. Um, what is a peak experience? And you capitalize the P in peak and the E in experience there. Um, what is peak experience and what behavioral changes are generally found in those who have a peak experience? Um, as you describe it in your recent book, Unseen Forces, the Integration of Science, Reality, and You. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you can, you can, the best way maybe by example, remember what, what uh, Bill Shatner uh, expressed when he landed back on Earth after going up into space a week or two ago? He had a peak experience. I don't think his view of the world is going to be the same again, a view of life, reality. Uh, he cried. That was, a, that was a Star Trek voice indeed of the real kind. And the point is, these kinds of epiphanies happen in all different ways, near-death experience, out-of-body experiences, to even tremendous stress. Um, can, for some reason, facilitate or trigger these kinds of aha movements that often, oftentimes serve as a safety valve for the person, a moment of reflection, uh, uh, a moment of questioning reality because the experience is so uh, unimaginable, extraordinary, ineffable. Uh, when we try to explain consciousness, we can't, uh, we don't have words. And these, this, these experiences or peak experiences also provide for that. How does one try to express the unconditional love they have when they had an NDE, a common symptom, or heaven? Uh, the beautiful landscape that they see, the words don't get added. And that's the, that's the issue right here. The peak experience transforms them, uh, makes them more humane. They, uh, they lose that ego. They become, uh, the, the world doesn't revolve around them as much anymore. Once they realize that life is more than, than just this, and, and the only way to understand that is to have a peak experience, but it requires uh, a, near, <laughs> a near death experience or something dramatic like that, or maybe even just going into space and seeing the little blue dot in space and, and people become more sensitive to the ecological matters of, of our planet. And don't fear death anymore, become less materialistic, more spiritual, less interested in organized religion, that they change as a result of these peak experiences become in many different ways and shapes and forms, but more empathy and compassion is, 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 is the game at hand. Uh, and that's a good thing. Yes, um, and I uh, myself would like to have a peak experience. One of the first things I wanted to be when I, when I, when I was a kid, the common question, what do you want to be when you grow up? The first thing I said was astronaut, and I do hope that in my lifetime, uh, the technology will come around where I will be able to um, hop in one of those uh, craft that's different from NASA technology, which will allow someone to like take a plane ride into space and uh, hopefully uh, not have to succumb to the, the problems that many astronauts claim to have to face when they um, go into outer space. Uh, so um, that's uh, <laughs> I can relate to that, I guess. Hopefully we'll be relate to that when I... Uh, in my future time. Next question, what evidence have you found in your investigation that may eventually prove that consciousness is not uh, a product of the brain? And if the brain uh, doesn't create it, where does it come from? You probably touched on this already, but um, yeah, this is obviously one of the biggest flaws of mainstream science, saying that um, consciousness is not the same as self-awareness because it's part of the brain. Well, no, it is the same as self-awareness and it's not part of the brain, but you uh, assert that that's different, so. Yeah. Right, and you know, you have to look at some anecdotal evidence to, to support the fact that consciousness is not the brain. So you have to consider some experiences uh, that Jeff Long presents on his Near Death Experience Research Foundation website, where he has individuals talk about their near death experience. Is and and there are many individuals who very lucidly express in writing on the website how they obtained information that they could not have received other than to have interacted with somebody on the other side. For instance, Eben Alexander talks about a case where he met a beautiful woman and she relayed to him that she had died before he was born. She was his sister and that she also shared information about him and his parents 
that he shared with his parents when he was revived. And when he did tell his parents what the woman said, that she was his sister who had passed away, and her name and other information, the parents looked at each other in, in disbelief, knowing full well none of that information was shared with them. The question is, what is all that about? You know, we have many cases like that and that have been documented. Um, and as rare as it is, all you need is one white crow. So we have these so-called veridical perceptions that occur in near-death experience situations. We have many, many types of research that has corroborated that. Uh, we have Global Consciousness Project, where random number generators become uh, non-random when the global consciousness of billions of people across the world are focused on a single event like 9-11 or the tsunami in 2004 or the election of President Obama. Here again, these computers, random number generators, actually alter their, their ability to generate zeros or ones. And it becomes non-random, which is extraordinarily rare. The question is, is there a global consciousness? And, and that also suggests that consciousness could be separate from the brains. How about the autistic savant, a four-year-old who speaks six different languages? The autistic savant who has remarkable math abilities, we don't understand why, who can tell you the cube root of a five-digit number to the third decimal point and is accurate. These kinds of examples, and they're out there, they're verifiable, I have no doubt. I know people, I know leading scientists who, who have studied these autistic savants. The brain doesn't do that, as far as I'm concerned, unless there's something about the brain we don't know. So we have, the point is we have different little bits and pieces of examples out there that Newtonian physics, the paradigm we operate under, of course, that, you know, that can't explain, and we can't expect them to. It's not designed to explain that. It really isn't. We await a paradigm shift. And that's what, again, our documentary, The Consciousness Connection, is all about. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, damn my computer for a page up. And um, so, well, actually, hang on. If you give me a moment here, I can uh, check my um, email to get your list of questions out. Just give me, uh, check my um, cell phone. Um, so just excuse me here. Sure. Okay, never, okay, it's working. Um, now, uh, how does science explain the existence of ESP? Okay, that's your next question. Okay. Existence of ESP. How does science explain the yeah. existence of ESP? Yeah. Yeah, well, we say it uh, at... <clears throat> Not easy to explain, except that we see that different levels of reality, behavior of electrons by the act of observation. We have mediums who can be accurately uh, provided information that's almost 80-90% accurate in some cases, not all. We have, uh, we have experiments that show that one's mental intention can modify certain physical systems like a random number generator or a laser interferometer or modify the pH of water just by the act of intention alone. So there are many different examples. They're often very subtle, hard to find, but they do exist if you look for it. Um, thank you. I'm still having problems with my computer here, so let me... Uh, um... Sorry, and I thought for a moment when I was on mute, so... Uh... Let me uh, get out my cell phone here. I think I better just have this here. I haven't promised it my computer for a while now. And uh, all right, question number uh, seven. Uh, what's your best guess and supporting rationale for UAP? It's a physical and non-physical phenomenon. We, we, we know that it's physical for a number of reasons. The depressions in the ground, it's monitored on radar, it's observed visually and by numerous witnesses at the same time. It gives off heat. You can see the velocity shifting up to 100,000 miles per hour and making right angle turns. So the kinematic behavior is well established. Just about everything else is poorly understood, it seems. Uh, and thus, it's, it's not known. But it has also a non-physical component to it, it seems. People claim to interact with it telepathically. 
as they say, and the, uh, they're also transformed by it. It's a remarkable experience to see a UFO and beings, as people contend. And a study we did as part of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Research Foundation, led by um, uh, Ray Hernandez, and Dr. Rudy Shield, and Russ Calpone and I, we wrote an article in the Journal of Scientific Exploration talking about just that, the kinds of interactions that people report, both being, again, physical and non-physical. And people, by and large, claim, at least 80% of the time, it's almost like an out-of-body experience when they interact with these phenomena, uh, where they feel as if they're float, being floated up into a matrix, interact with grays, the typical energy beings, and other types of non-human intelligences that people have been reporting for decades. Uh, and quite consistently today. So the question is, what is this all about? Um, so it's quite complex, both physical and non-physical in nature, I would say. Thank you. Um, next. Uh, okay, I thought it was on mute, but I wasn't. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, next question. You talk about interactive aerial phenomena in your book. Can you explain why you favor this term and how does plasma enter your theory? Well, so just a two cents worth. These theories come and go and don't interpret it too literally, but it, it seems to be interactive. People claim certainly that it's a true. There is contact being established with, with this intelligence. So it's a scripted term. Uh, certainly we see it in the air and we don't know what it is, as opposed to calling it <laughs> unidentified, uh, aerial identified phenomena seem to be a little bit point is, there's evidence that you very well demonstrate some degree of intelligence. And uh, separate studies done by astrophysicists Rutledge and Tior Durrani uh, come to that s s conclusion. There's a willful intention, a form of interaction that's purpose purposeful in nature behind the lights, shall we call it, interacting lights. And uh, certainly individuals report that. We also have scientific confirmation, however, and and the thing is, um, what's the message? Is this the angels from a long time ago? Of course, as many people continue to speculate about. Uh, are we the new kids on the block? Obviously, uh, we, these are the common questions that we're all asking uh, ourselves. Uh, and people in, the, in, in greater ivory towers than you and I are probably scratching their heads as well trying to communicate with it and uh, blend in, in Bible and folklore, as, as we are seeing today uh, in various media forms. Mm. Uh, thank you. And uh, question number nine, do you think UAP are physical or non-physical and why? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess I kind of answered that uh, accidentally in the last uh, last question, but I, they're both. They're both, as I mentioned, and uh, non-physical in the sense that it seems to be a form of telepathy, which may be physical, but people report that common aspect of communication, which we always hear about. So let's call that non-physical as opposed to shaking the being's hand, let, let's call it that. So uh, are these individuals seeing a different world or seeing this world differently? Then that's a debate that science and, and experiences are continually having. Uh, and um, things are too fragmented in medicine, psychology, I mean, even within the fields of science and, and ufology itself in terms of trying to integrate and make a meaningful information out of, out of all this, these bits of information and pieces of evidence that are poorly understood, poorly documented, and uh, rarely addressed in scientific venues where it should be. Thank you. Question number 10. What are your thoughts about quantum mechanics to explain anomalous events? Well, before I, uh, you explain this, you already touched on this earlier, saying that quantum mechanics can explain mm -hmm. a lot of anomalous things. But uh, one thing I've um, heard debated is that it's not a good, it's not very healthy to obsess about quantum mechanics too much because quantum mechanics is the science of how the third dimension of consciousness works. And if you, as interesting as it may be, quantum mechanics, if you are concerned so much without the, how the third dimension of consciousness works, then you are unfortunately 
going to keep yourself trapped in the third dimension of consciousness, which will prevent your consciousness expansion. So uh, I guess that's one question I, I need to ask you to agree or disagree on. And then also after that, explain your um, thoughts on quantum mechanics to explain anomalous events. Yeah, well, I, it's hard to, it's hard to elaborate. Um, look, uh, we don't, we, we, I don't, the fact is that we're conscious and we're trying to explain consciousness. So it's like the law of identity. We're trying to explain ourselves. It's hard to, it's hard to do. It's kind of symbolic, metaphorical. Uh, and it get, does get into all these altered aspects of, of dimensionality and language get, again gets, gets in the way. But quantum mechanics it explains, uh, it explains better than Newtonian physics. Not that quantum mechanics has all the answers, by no means. But there are certain principles, like the law of entanglement, for instance, that, that does seem to uh, help to explain aspects of ESP that Newtonian physics doesn't touch. Again, not that that is the answer because quantum mechanics is also highly controversial. It's not, not a, a uniformly agreed upon by science, but I, I can see in the future it'll be integrated. Some principles will be integrated. Some principles are proving to be true. Quantum processes do occur in the brain, occur in, in all aspects of reality. Photosynthesis is a quantum process. It's well, well established as a part of life, quantum processes. So how these natural occurring quantum processes in the brain interact possibly with external quantum events, and that's the whole point. Bombs explicate, implicate order. I mean, is there an interaction between external and internal? Could you, these UAPs be interacting with us and can the brain be facilitating outside and internal energies? Who knows? And could it be torsion energy? Many theories abound. Uh, and that's the, the entertaining yet frustrating aspect of the whole thing. What is the complexity of reality about? How do we better understand it? And do experiences through a peak experience help us to better understand it? And, and here again, consciousnessfilm.info, our website for the film documentary, The Conscious Connection, attempts to get at all this. And that's the message. Let's shift the paradigm by studying these topic areas. Thank you very much. Uh, question. Oh, we're uh, flying by these pretty quickly, so give me enough time. I guess I'll uh, ask all these questions, and then the um, rest of the interview will be um, pay-per-view, and I'll be able to get into my own subject matter. So you talk about the need to integrate the science of the subjective with the science of the physical to better understand the nature of reality. Why do you think this is important? Uh, <clears throat> because millions of people are having a, a very deep personal event so that's modifying their, their viewpoints on life and reality in ways that uh, they never thought they could. And that is being facilitated by an extraordinary event, the peak experience. I mean, now we have many scientists who are understanding some of the science, possible science behind it, and I'm trying to explain it. And many people are also coming out sharing their personal experiences like they never had before, seeking answers to questions about what, what did I just experienced when I had a near-death thought about body experience, UAP event, and all that, where they're questioning reality. And they're not alone, and they're very sane from all walks of life. The science of the subjective is just about that. How do we better understand them, help them, and, and do these kinds of personal experiences of a pronounced degree that's life-altering in many different psycho-spiritual ways, does that give us some better understanding and realization of what we think is reality as seen through our 3D senses? Or is there more, something that can be captured in our country, the consciousness connection, consciousnessfilm.info. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, drive me crazy. It's a good thing I upload. I appreciate You're it. Well, welcome. Uh, God, my computer is freezing again since I tried to get, check welcome. out your uh, um, site again. And once again, I have my little phone handy here. So, um, number 12, why do we need a paradigm shift in 
science. Well, <laughs> well, for one, aside from the fact that he's so yeah. paradigmatic, uh, it's make them change their mind. That's another. That's one reason. But there's other, um, and a lot of things we learn in science are wrong. We're not. Don't tell the whole truth. But that's another thing. So I'm not going to babble anymore. Why do you think we need a paradigm shift in science? Yeah, and uh, you know, in closing, for all the reasons we discussed, really, to to merge the subjective with the physical, to help explain our experiencing through their peak experiences in all the many ways that it occurs, and to offer counseling, psychological support that they need, uh, so that they can feel free to express about what just happened to me and when I had a near death experience and I had felt this unconditional love and. Interact with deceased relatives and all that. How, you know, how, how do we deal with that? That that's a science that's a subjective. Only a paradigm shift is is going to allow, I think, for a great acceptance of of the subjective dimension, um, which needs to be. A, and how best we integrate that is is a difficult task, but one that requires a multidisciplinary approach by science, non-science experiences, and everybody in between. So. Um, thank you, and then thank you all for your support for the documentary. I appreciate it. Consciousfilm.info is a website. Thank you. Yes, that's the. I will make sure I put that website as, and also your your website, BobDavisSpeaks.com, in you. your description. Um, well, actually, your number thirteen was. Do you have last thoughts to share with the audience? But I'm gonna say, no, 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 let's not go there yet it. because I got some other. Um, things I want to talk about with you um, before uh, we bring this interview close because I wanted okay. to go for an hour and um, this at mm -hmm. this point sure. um, all my listeners will have to uh, uh, pay me on Patreon uh, don't mean to sound uh, like a dick when I say oh, have sure, to pay sure. me on Patreon but uh, I, I need mm -hmm. to be a little nicer when I ask people that in order to get people to um, want to subscribe to my Patreon account to be able to um, listen to the last 50% uh, of my shows now and again folks it's going to be 50% uh, 35, 40% didn't seem to be enough to uh, convince people to think that my, that it's worthy enough of paying me the uh, fee to, to listen to it. So it's now going to be 50% of the interviews, uh, that's of the interview, not 50% not of the shows uh, total, but just the last 50% of each interview will be a uh, few. Uh, the link to the Patreon will be in the video description. So uh, please click on that, folks, if you want to listen to the rest of this. But um, with that being said, still have time to discuss some other subjects and uh, 